Okay, everyone. So today's webinar is focusing on rapid virus identification in, in biological samples. And the first thing that we want to do this morning is, is go through the webinar agenda, right? And so we're going to focus first on the key features of the hyperspectral microscope system for those of you that might not be familiar with the technology. From there, we're going to go straight into a live demonstration where we're going to conduct some hyperspectral analysis of, of virus particles in a whole blood sample. And we're going to really show you how hyperspectral imaging works the context of the microscope system, including showing spectral uh, identification and comparison of virus particles versus red blood cells, and do some comparative uh, mapping of virus particles in positive versus negative control samples. Then we'll come back to the PowerPoint. We'll do a detailed overview of the technology focused on the two most important aspects of the technology, and that's our patented enhanced dark field optics and hyperspectral imaging. And then finally, we're going to go through some really detailed uh, application examples focused on virology, uh, looking at H1N1, RSV virus, uh, an HIV simulant virus, and then talk about how we can discriminate between viruses as well. Then finally, we'll roll into the uh, questions and answers. So with that, I'm going to actually come off of the PowerPoint here for just a second and go right into a hyperspectral image so that you can observe what a hyperspectral image is and what you can do with it. So it's sort of like a show and tell. We're going to show you what it is first and then we'll tell you the details about how it works as a follow-up, okay? So the very first thing that we want to do, and in, in, in some of these webinars we've actually captured a hyperspectral image live on the microscope and we're not going to do that today in the interest of time. But what we do want to do is demonstrate for you how you actually capture a hyperspectral image. And so what I'm moving around on my screen right now is the actual GUI that we use for the hyperspectral microscope controls. And if we want to capture a hyperspectral image, as you see over here in the center of the screen, the first thing that we would do is we would choose the proper microscope magnification that we're using, and that's so that we can uh, – feed that to the software to make sure that the image produces square pixels. The next thing that it will want to know is what the exposure setting should be. So now after we've set the exposure setting, we want to create a hyperspectral image file name, which we would do here. And then we would actually decide how large we want the hyperspectral image to be in terms of the number of lines from the center of the field of view. Okay. And then we capture the image. As I mentioned, we're not going to actually do an actual live image capture in, in the uh, interest of time, but the image that you see here, there are actually two images here. This is a, a live blood cell sample of a subject that uh, had a very severe upper uh, respiratory virus infection. This is the very same subject about a month later once they were symptom-free of, of, of the virus. Now, it's important for us to, to tell you that we're not sure exactly what type of virus that we were looking at here. That's not the point of this exercise. The point is just to demonstrate when virus particles are present, uh, what, uh, what you can actually uh, see, observe, and the types of analysis that you can do. So if we look at the uh, blood sample with the uh, virus infection, the first thing you notice is are these, uh, the scatter from these, I'll, I'll say, bluish particles that are in the, mostly in the plasma of the whole blood sample here. In the zoom window, you can see one, two, three particles that are present there. And with hyperspectral imaging, it's, it's very unique and different from optical imaging, for example, in that every pixel of the image contains that pixel's optical spectral response. In this case, with the vis near from 400 to 1,000 nanometers, if we click on the Z profile, in this case, Z is not Z spatial up and down. It's a Z spectrum, meaning it's the spectrum behind every pixel. And so in the plasma, where we are here, we produce this spectrum. It's really a spectrum with a lot of noise because the plasma doesn't produce uh, much of a spectral response. But if I move the crosshair over to a virus particle, this bluish particle that we see here, that you see a very distinct spectral response um, with, a, with, a, with a high amplitude. If I click on another viral particle here, 
you see an almost identical spectral response. And maybe because of where it is in terms of the z-axis uh, uh, profile, you maybe see a, a smaller uh, spectral response amplitude here in, in the y-axis if we move back over. But they're, but they're very similar. Now, if I were to collect spectrum and we wanted to compare that spectrum versus the spectrum of the red blood cell membrane that's right here on the right, you see a dramatically different spectrum. And that's because the hemoglobin and, and other chemistry in the red blood cell has really different optical spectral characteristics versus the virus particle. Now, in this case, we, we chose this field of view in the zoom window because we actually have a virus particle that's interacting with the red blood cell as well here. And if we click on it, we now really see three different spectral profiles. We see the virus particle in plasma. We see the red blood cell by itself, the red blood cell membrane. But if we look at a virus particle that's actually interacting with the red blood cell, we see sort of a hybrid spectrum of the two other ones, OK? The purpose of this illustration is to demonstrate to you how optical hyperspectral imaging allows you to be able to measure the optical spectral response of multiple different materials in the field of view. So now if you're able to capture all of this optical spectrum in every pixel of the image, there are a lot of analysis capabilities that you can do with this. Comparative analysis capabilities such as you see here, you can do that in large regions of interest. Uh, you can map spectrum from pixels based on just its peak wavelength or you can map spectrum based on the complete optical spectrum that's located in each pixel. So the last exercise that we wanted to do here today is actually show you how you can conduct spectral mapping, okay? And if I want to conduct spectral mapping, the first thing that I need to do is actually create a spectral library. And if I do that, I would come here, click on, in this case, if I want to build a spectral library of the viral particles in the plasma, I would collect spectrum and collect multiple pixels, right? And then I would save those pixels as a spectral library, right? And so that's the way you would build a spectral library. The next thing that I would want to do with that spectral library is I would want to filter it against the negative control. So the sample that we see here below is sample, uh, a blood sample from the same uh, subject as we saw above, but taken a month later. One of the things you don't see in this negative control sample, you don't see these uh, blue uh, punctate uh, scattered particles throughout the sample, and that's because the subject no longer was uh, suffering uh, the uh, upper respiratory virus symptoms, and the viral particles don't appear to be in the blood sample. But if I want to make sure that the spectral library that I build from the positive control sample doesn't have false positives, there's a feature in the software where you can actually filter that spectral library against all of the pixels of the control image so that you ensure that you don't have false positives in the spectral library. Now, over in this window that you see here, you see three different image files. The first file this is the infected uh, blood sample that we see here. This is the control, negative control that we see here. This is a spectral library that was previously built and filtered in the process that I showed you a little bit earlier, okay? So what we want to do right now is take this spectral library and we want that it's been filtered and map it against the positive control sample. So to do that, we're going to come over here to mapping methods and we're going to pick a spectral mapping algorithm called Spectral Angle Mapper, which is a very well-established spectral mapping algorithm that's used uh, uh, in, in hyperspectral image analysis uh, extensively. And we want to take this sample, which is the exposed sample, and we want to map it. So it's going to bring this window up and ask us is there's a spectral library that we want to map against. And we're going to select the spectral library that was previously built that we know we've already filtered against the negative control. And so these are all of the spectrum that were in that spectral library that we built. And we're going to select them all. And now it wants to know how we want to output the classification or the mapping that it's going to run. 
And in the spectral mapping algorithm, there's a, there's a, a threshold that you can set for sensitivity. We're going to go with the default threshold of 0.1. Uh, we, we won't try to go into the details of, of that here today, but that's the default threshold, and it, it can be changed in different circumstances. And so what we're actually doing right now is that we are comparing that spectral library against every spectrum in this positive control sample, positive for virus particles. And the software completed that exercise in just a few seconds, as you could see. Now what we want to do is take this memory file, this classification file that we built, and we want to overlay that onto the image. And here is that memory file that we created. And we're going to overlay it here with all of these spectrum. And every pixel that matches for the virus spectrum that's been filtered against the negative control is mapped in this image. So you can see the mapping here. If we turn back on the areas that didn't map, and one of the things that we can do is we can merge classes to make all of the mapping appear red. Just gives you a better ability to, to see those areas. Now you see them all, all of the virus particles that match that spectral library are mapped red. And if we turn off the classification here, uh, you could see where they are a little bit better. And if we turn them off and turn them back on there, you can see the mapping. So that, that's just uh, one thing that we wanted to do to just demonstrate for you just one feature of hyperspectral imaging, and it's a principal feature of hyperspectral imaging, and it's the mapping algorithm to demonstrate, in this case, the ability to map viral nanoparticles in a whole blood sample. Now, it's important to mention that this blood sample, this whole blood sample, was not altered in any way. There's no fluorescent labeling. There's no special sample preparation like you would expect for electron microscopy. It's one of the distinct advantages of this capability. So with that, and we want to go through key features of the system. So as you can see, we can do optical imaging of nanoscale biological or material samples without any labels or special sample prep. So now as you see this image of the virus particles in the blood cell, this looks familiar to you, right? We, we just went through that in the hyperspectral uh, software that we were looking at just a little while ago. You can also measure the optical spectral measurements in every nanoscale pixel. So the optical spectrum could be surface plasmon resonance. If you were looking at plasmonic nanoparticles, such as gold nanoparticles or silver nanoparticles, it can be scatter. In the case of the virus particles, we're looking at the scatter from the virus particles. And it's important to note as we go through these examples that scatter from a sample does not produce, it's not the true size of the material, it's the scatter size of that material. And generally the scatter size of material will be larger than the material itself. And different types of materials produce different scatter size based on their scatter intensity. And we'll, um, we'll show you some examples of that. Now the red blood cell, principally because of the hemoglobin, whether you want to call that scatter or you want to call that uh, emission, or photoluminescence or, or bioluminescence, whatever you want to call that in terms of the emission, there's a little different characteristic there to that. Um, and then finally, because we have all of the spectrum in every pixel, there's detailed uh, optical spectral analysis that we can conduct. And we showed you the mapping as one example of what, what we, we can do and conduct with this, with this system. So just to give you just a brief background on whose side of EV is, if you're, if you're not familiar, we're a private company. Uh, we were born out of research at Auburn University, which is a state university uh, in southeastern United States. We're in the research park at Auburn University. Uh, and we were developed to uh, commercialize nanoscale optical imaging technology developed at the university and uh, have been uh, providing these technologies now for about 15 years. Our technology is available and, and has been uh, distributed in over 350 research labs worldwide. Those research labs and our focus have primarily been focused on nanomaterials and nanomaterials imaging in biological environments. However, today is a pure biological application 
and we have a number of systems that are involved in pure biological applications. And we work with uh, local distributors in all these markets around the world. We want to give you just a, a, a brief sense of the, of the footprint of the system because that, that helps you to sort of visualize what we're doing here. You see that everything centers around the standard research grade optical microscope. We have some very special patented enhanced dark field illumination optics, which are designed to fit into the condenser mount of this standard research grade optical microscope. You see a diffraction grading spectrograph and integrated CCD on the dual port camera mount. We're in the back here. We have a, an optical camera as well where you can capture optical images or hyperspectral images. Of course, the difference being the hyperspectral images produces the spectral data. That hyperspectral image is built in a line scan or push broom method. And so for that, we use a translational stage where we push the sample, and they refer to this as push broom technology, across the field of view of the, uh, of the microscope image, the diffraction grading spectrograph and camera, and build that image pixel row by pixel row. The image we were looking at of the blood and the virus particles actually uh, had about 400 pixel rows in the image. And that took somewhere between two to three minutes to build that image. So we build these images very quickly, especially compared if you think about imaging for other techniques such as um, atomic force microscopy or Raman uh, microscopy. This technique is really fast in comparison, okay? So the, now we want to transition and talk about some of the really unique elements of the side of the technology that allow us to be able to do things like image virus particles and capture hyperspectral images of virus particles in complex environments. The first and most important technology and everything that we do at Cytobiva is centered around our enhanced dark field optics. Now, a lot of people really aren't familiar with dark field uh, microscopy and how it works. And at the core of dark field microscopy, is using a very shallow or oblique angle illumination method for uh, illuminating the sample. So if we have uh, a sample of whole blood or maybe epithelial cells with viruses on the microscope slide, we're sending light at a very oblique angle such that the light interacts with the sample, but the source light bypasses the objective because the, object, the numerical aperture of the objective or its ability to accept light is slightly below the numerical aperture or the angle of the light itself, the direct source light. However, because it does interact with the sample, scatter from the sample goes into the microscope objective. And what I'm describing there is basic dark field. But what makes Cytoviva's dark field so different is how we manage the light from the light source to the condensing system versus standard off-the-shelf dark field condensers. And here, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, going through the details of this, but we manage the light significantly different so that, one, we get more photons to the condenser. But most importantly, we're actually managing the light and trying to shape the light to meet, to match the geometry of the condenser itself. And when we do that, we are able to enhance the signal to noise ratio, the ability to observe scatter from very small nanoscale particles like the virus particles you were looking at earlier, um, and be able to see those much easier and with much more intensity than you can with standard dark field optics. So to try to demonstrate how much better this signal to noise ratio is, we thought we would use a published paper from one of our customers in Korea. So this customer is involved in microchip electrophoresis work where they're actually looking at um, iron oxide nanoparticles in this microchip electrophoresis uh, environment. And they've used our enhanced dark field uh, optics for a number of years, and they produce these really high signal to noise images that makes their work with the microchip electrophoresis really easy. And so, you know, while they were doing this experiment one time, they said, wow, I wonder if it's possible for us to even conduct this experiment using standard dark field optics. And so one of the things that they did is, is they actually took quantitative measurements of the difference of an identical particle using the two different illumination methods, standard dark field, side of even enhanced dark field. 
And what they were quantitatively able to measure is about a 10x increase in signal to noise ratio versus off the shelf dark field optics from Olympus or Nikon or Zeiss, et cetera. And I think these were Olympus dark field optics that they were using here. And so this is a really good way through a third party validation to demonstrate how well these enhanced dark field optics from Cytobiba work compared to, to standard dark field optics. With that, we want to transition really briefly and, and, and talk about hyperspectral imaging and just really explain how it works. So with hyperspectral imaging at, at Cytobiba, we're able to work in the Wiener visual near infrared range from 400 to 1,000 nanometers or the shortwave infrared range from 900 to 1,700 nanometers. We could put both of these different spectrographs with different detectors on the microscope at the same time if we want to and collect images of both. However, um, for most of these biological applications, we find that, um, that the, uh, the Visnir or the Wiener works better and produces, um, and produces the, the more accurate spectrum. Uh, but there are lots of SWIR applications there, uh, some in biological uh, applications, and then also many in, in material science. So depending on the microscope objective that we're using, pixel sizes in the image can be very small. At 100x objective, pixel sizes are typically around 128 nanometers. Uh, spectral resolution, not spatial, but spectral resolution is about two nanometers. And what that means is, is that if, uh, for example, we're looking at a change in the spectrum from 500 nanometers to 510 nanometers in the spectrum, if there's a change there with two nanometers of spectral resolution, I will record that change because two nanometers of spectral resolution is within that 10 nanometer area that I just talked about. And as you already know, the coolest thing about hyperspectral imaging is that the data is presented to you not only as a spectral curve, but also as an image, a red, green, blue image. You get all of the spectral data in really high spatial context. And then you can, of course, conduct detailed quantitative analysis from every nanoscale pixel as a result of, of having all that data there. This really puts it all together because this demonstrates how hyperspectral imaging really benefits at the nanoscale from the enhanced dark field optics. And so this is an image of a 100 nanometer gold particle, and we're actually demonstrating the exact same particle and the exact same pixel spectrum using all of the exact same settings, just using a standard dark field uh, uh, optics on the left and using the side of even enhanced dark field optics on the right. All spectroscopy is dependent on good signal to noise to produce quality data. And you can see here lots of noise and not much amplitude, hardly any noise, and plenty of amplitude, relative amplitude here uh, in, in the y-axis uh, of the signal, and the image just says it all. Lots of signal and not much noise, lots of noise and not much signal. So now with that, we're going to stop talking about the technology in, in terms of, of how it works and give you guys some examples of, of how it works with different virology applications that, 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 that we've been involved in or that we've had clients that have published papers with. So the side, it, it's important for me to note that, that and, I, and I said so earlier, that Cytoviva technology has primarily been utilized by nanobiotechnology researchers focused on engineered nanoparticles. That's been our focus. But um, there is some significant utility in virus research, whether it's pathogenic virus detection and also viral cancer immunotherapy applications. You know, as one of my colleagues told me uh, the other day, we were talking about, you know, viruses are nanoparticles too. Well, they're just naturally occurring nanoparticles. And their sizes generally range from about 80 to 200 nanometers in size. For example, the coronavirus that we, of course, everyone's so familiar with right now, about 125 to 150 nanometer size of the coronavirus, right? Just to give you some context. We can detect virus particles pretty easily down in that 70 to 80 nanometer range. And we would equate that in the engineered nanomaterial world to liposomes, which are engineered for drug delivery, which we have a detection capability yeah, 50 to 70 nanometers or so. We want to start with an example that's uh, an example of a published uh, paper 
uh, from Dr. Raju Body Ready, uh, who is a, we consider him a power user at Side of You. He has used it for a long time. And he was doing some work a number of years ago with the H1N1 virus in lung epithelial cells. And this is, uh, this is the actual paper that he published back in 2014. And Dr. Body Ready uh, and his colleagues were looking at single wall carbon nanotubes. This was an inhalation toxicology related paper. It really wasn't a virology paper, but pure and simple. But he was looking at how single wall carbon nanotubes uh, would increase the H1N1 virus infectivity of lung epithelial cells. And one of the things that, that he was able to do was not just identify virus particles in these lung epithelial cells, but also identify the carbon nanotubes simultaneously and be able to conduct mapping, the spectral mapping we showed earlier of virus particles with spectral mapping of the carbon nanotubes simultaneously in the sample. This is, this is a really deep dive, we think, from our technology perspective, but it really shows the power. So this is a zoom image that I, that I have where I pulled from the paper. And you see here in this zoom image, the blue mapping is the mapping of the spectrum of the single wall carbon nanotube. The red mapping is the mapping of the H1N1 virus in the, the lung epithelial cell. And so utilizing this technique, he was able to visualize co-localization and increases or decreases in viral infectivity of the epithelial lung cell based on this case of the presence of the single wall carbon nanotubes. And one of the things they were able to show is that single wall carbon nanotubes increases the infectivity of the H1N1 and the lung epithelial cells here. So there's a, an additional example that we want to show you here. And, and the relevance of this example is to look at pure virus particles here and to look at them with another nanoparticle in the field of view. And this is a sample that we captured a number of years ago working with, a, with another, another research group. And in this field of view, we see uh, RSV, which some people refer to as the common cold virus. And it's in a sample with gold nanoparticles. And in this case, they were actually, this research group was actually working on the potential for these gold nanoparticles as biosensors for the virus. And a, the gold nanoparticles were on the microscope slide and under the cover slip. And this research group wanted to introduce the viral particles and to understand if they could observe gold nanoparticles and virus particles simultaneously and measure their spectrum. So they took the pipette tip with a very high titer of the RSV and they released the, the uh, virus particles on the edge of the cover slip and the microscope slide. And what actually happens is, is that capillary action pulls those virus particles across the field of view underneath the cover slip and, and on top of the, the slide. And so you can see what looks like here, more concentration of virus particles here. And as it spreads across the image field of view, it seems that maybe we have less virus particles here. Now, a couple of important notes. The first thing that's really obvious is, is we pull multiple spectrum from multiple different pixels of the gold particles. You see this spectrum here. They have a peak at about 550 nanometers, and it's sort of a single peak, and there's not much else in terms of the shape of the curve to that. When we pick virus particle spectrum, however, you see a much different spectral curve throughout, right? And you see it uh, starts up with the shoulder here at about 475 nanometers and then another peak here at about 575 nanometers. So very different spectrum, right? Interestingly enough, the RSV particles are bigger than the gold particles. But this is a great example where these gold nanoparticles, which appear green in this field of view, they look bigger, right? And they look bigger because the scatter efficiency of a noble metal nanoparticle is much greater than the scatter efficiency of a virus particle. So while the viral particles are actually larger in size, they look smaller in this field of view. But the idea here is not that we know the true size. The idea here is that we can detect the presence of these particles, whether they're gold or whether they're virus particles, based on their optical spectral response and by seeing them. Here we conducted the mapping algorithm based on the spectral library that we built of the, uh, of, the, of the virus particles. And so a couple things you notice, first of all, the gold particles don't map, right? Because they don't match the spectrum. 
The second thing is that you can see here where the pipette tip was put on the edge of the cover slip, and a very high titer of the virus was allowed to flow across the field of view with capillary action, which pulls these virus particles across. And you see, you know, we're mapping every pixel except for the gold, where the gold is here in the upper right-hand side. As we get in the lower left area, we're mapping very little virus because there's very little virus there, okay? And so this demonstrates how you can distinguish between different materials in the sample and how where you have lots of uh, uh, material to map you, you do so here, and when you don't have much to map you, you don't map much material here in this example. So we want to go back now and just take you through the sample that we looked at a little bit earlier very quickly. So this is the sample we looked at quickly of the uh, whole blood with the virus particles in it. This is the spectral mapping that we conducted earlier. I want to go back and show you something. But look everywhere we have virus particles that are on the blood cell. We created a spectral library to only map virus particles that were in the plasma. So we don't map the guys that are clearly interacting with the red blood cells. That wasn't our intent there. Just wanted to show you that that difference to discriminate. Here we are with just spectral mapping only. And here we are showing you again the virus particle on the red blood cell and its spectrum and how different it is from the virus particle in the plasma and that we map these guys and we don't map this one again. And here we are with the negative control and we when we conduct the spectral mapping algorithm there, we don't show any mapping because there's not any mapping, because there's no match. Now, finally, we can provide some quantitative comparative data here. And in here, this class distribution report is telling us how many pixels that we mapped in the virus exposed sample versus how many pixels we mapped uh, in the negative control sample, 213 versus zero. I want to show one last, I think, example of a virus particle looking at uh, an HIV stimulant virus in a live epithelial cell. And these are the actual virus particles. And again, I'll remind you that this is the scatter from the particles at about 400x, 100x plus a 4x digital zoom of the isolated viral particles. This is the epithelial cell that was incubated with the virus particles. Now, just from an optical observation, you'd never be able to tell virus particles versus uh, 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 endosomes or other portions of the, uh, of the uh, actual epithelial cell. However, using the spectral mapping algorithm for the virus particles and, and filtering that against the negative control cell, we're able to clearly map where the virus particles exist here in this image. And here is showing the different spectrum. And we're comparing the cell itself versus the virus particles here. And you can see some significant difference, of course, in their spectrum as well again. So finally, one of the questions that, that we're starting to get asked a lot is, can you show some quantitative data on differentiating virus particles based on their reflectance spectrum? That work has not been done yet, to our knowledge. We have not done that internally here at Cytoviva, but, but um, we know that different types of virus particles are producing different optical spectrum. And so I just want to go back and look at different virus particles that were captured in different areas at vastly different time frames, right? And the first thing we see here is the RSV that we were looking at earlier, and it in multiple spectrum from it. The, uh, in the, in the uh, whole blood sample, this is an example uh, spectrum uh, from the unknown virus uh, that was in the whole blood sample. And then here, the red, we see the H1N1 from Dr. Bobby Reddy's uh, lab and its spectrum. If you see the red line from each of those three, we see that the RSV has a peak at about 570 nanometers versus the unknown virus at about 530 nanometers versus the H1N1 at about 625 nanometers. And if you remember earlier, we talked about having a spectral resolution of two nanometers, right? So if I have just a change in the peak of 40 nanometers, I'm well within that two nanometer uh, spectral resolution range for differentiation. But there's significant differences in the overall curves of these viruses. So we have a high degree of confidence that if we're able to 
capture these uh, virus particles and, and build separate spectral libraries, even if these viral particles were mixed, we, we should have some success separating one from the other uh, and being able to differentiate one virus from another, which would be important for, uh, for uh, utilizing the system going forward for other applications. And we want to give you, sort of in closing, uh, an example of how that's been done, not with viruses, but with bacteria. We were really pleased to see um, from a group here at Auburn University that uh, was led by Dr. Vitaly Vojinoy, who has led the original development of the enhanced dark field optics that we use at Cytobiva. They were looking at hyperspectral imaging of single bacteria, a foodborne uh, bacteria, and they wanted to know how well they could differentiate those bacteria. They were looking at Salmonella, E. coli, and Listeria. And you see some spectral response curves in this paper that was recently published. And I'm not going to read this conclusion, and we're going to give everybody a copy of this, um, of this um, PowerPoint presentation. And you can go read this really interesting paper later if you want. But they were able to quantitatively demonstrate statistically demonstrate that these three bacteria in different time periods, they were able to quantitatively differentiate them based on their spectrum, and that's the same kind of work that, that will need to be done uh, with the virus particles that we were, we were looking at a little bit earlier. We wanted to, to show that. So in closing, and we, we want to finish here, we've looked at enhanced dark field hyperspectral microscopy and how it can be used to image a wide range of viruses in different biological environments without any special sample preparation. That's really what differentiates it. From the time we took a sample to the time we were analyzing data that can be just a few minutes, really quickly. We can spectrally discriminate quite easily between the virus particles and other biological materials in the sample. And we can spectrally map virus particles based on their unique optical spectral response. Something that I wanted to share with everybody as sort of a close, though, um, that I found really interesting, and we, we talked about Dr. Vitaly Vojinoy, who was the original developer of our technology, and an early video, they were looking at uh, bacteriophage attached to Staphylococcus aureus, and, and in this image that we have right here, this is a video that I'm going to actually play a little bit here. You can see a staph bacteria here, and there are two virus phage heads on the bacteria. Now, to me, it's just amazing that we can see this bacteria here, and we can see and, and distinguish and actually resolve between these two uh, phages that are on the bacteria in this video that we have. And when I first saw this, 15 years ago, I was really blown away about, by it, and, and I thought just in closing that it was just a, a really cool example to demonstrate the power of, of the site of EVA enhanced dark field optic, and wanted to show that. So with that, we've reached the, uh, we've reached the end of the, uh, the uh, webinar, and I'm going to turn here and see if we have some questions, and if we do, we'll, we'll, we'll begin to answer those as, as best we can, and we'll go through these. Okay, we have a, a question that says, uh, good morning. Indeed, it's possible to take hyperspectral images of blood cells. Don't they move while the acquisition is going on? Yes, sample preparation and, and how you do a blood smear on the, uh, on the, on the microscope slide is, is really important. Um, I had someone that, that uh, had uh, hospital, uh, was a hospital technician that, that was affiliated with Cytoviva at one time. And she taught me how to do a blood smear. And so the ability to, to uh, put the images, uh, put the sample on the, the microscope slide in such a way, and in some cases you may have to let them settle and dry because you're right. You can't have the sample elements moving while you're doing the line scan of the hyperspectral image. But um, there are some methods and techniques for, for, for getting them on the slide in such a way so they don't move around. Uh, and, and that has to be done. But, but that's a very good question, and, uh, and uh, that's an important part of, of, of what you have to do as part of utilizing the system. It says, so we have another question here that says, what's the speed and how is the spectrum generated? Is it using a tunable filter? <laughs> no, it's, it's using a, 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 um, a diffraction grading spectrograph. 
okay? And so it's a line scan diffraction grading spectrograph, and we build this image pixel row by pixel row. And the reason why we use uh, a line scan method is that line scan hyperspectral imaging is the most well-developed and the most robust hyperspectral imaging in our opinion. We get the full uh, optical spectrum in every pixel at high degree of spectral resolution with really nice speed and it's nice and reliable. And that's why we use the, that method that we use. Um, it says, presumably you initially identify the virus within the blood from the knowledge of this. Is this a virus infected sample? There's not a spectral library which would inform you that the spectrum of the particle uh, means is indeed a virus. And, and that's a really good point. Hyperspectral imaging is based off of known material, right, where you have to create a known positive and negative control from which to build your spectral library. So, for example, if I wanted to build a spectral library of coronavirus in whole blood, I would have to knowingly be utilizing a, a blood sample that I knew had the virus particles in it, right, uh, in a positive control, a known positive. And I would build that spectral library off of the known positive, and then I would test it off of a known negative control, right? And so the spectral library has to be built in that fashion, right, off of a known positive and a known negative. And you can build that spectral library however you want from a comprehensive method perspective. If you'll recall, we did when we built the spectral library, we purposely didn't pick virus that were on the blood cell because we wanted to just demonstrate that we could map spectrum or map virus uh, based on what was present in the plasma and not on the blood cell. If I were building a comprehensive spectral library, I'd probably pick a virus that were on the blood cell as well as virus that were in the plasma so that I could uh, have a really comprehensive spectrum of all the conditions which that uh, virus particle might be there. Said, so, okay, what is the price of a system? Well, great question. That That's going to vary, of course, based on what type of system components that you might need. If we we're looking at one that would support the virus application that we're talking about here, the full system costs, everything from the light source all the way down to the computer and, and, and image analysis software fully installed in the laboratory is going to be about 145,000 U.S. Uh, completely installed uh, and ready to go. Another question says, so is the scattered light from any pixel recorded in order to obtain spectrum? And, and the answer is yes. We're, we're recording all of the spectrum in the field of view uh, that, we're, that we're collecting, and you can analyze that in any pixel in the image. Could you say more about the potential use of Raman in combination uh, with enhanced dark field and hyperspectral imaging? Absolutely. Thanks for, uh, for asking that question and bringing that comment up. Um, this is a really important thing, and Side of Eva uh, had entered into a partnership with Hariba Scientific. Uh, Hariba is, is the leading Raman provider, one of the leading Raman providers in the world. And Hariba and Raman have entered into a partnership where Side of Eva's enhanced dark field hyperspectral microscopy can be seamlessly integrated on the Hariba Raman systems. And that's important because Raman, as you know, creates uh, a, a quantitative uh, signal of materials in the in the sample image based on its molecular fingerprint, quantitative based on the molecular fingerprint. And that's uh, Cytobiva is creating optical spectrum, right? So we're creating different types of spectral response signatures that we're recording. Optical or hyperspectral image is really high spatial, high resolution imagery based um, spectral imaging and spectral analysis. Raman doesn't really create a, an image. Raman can do Raman mapping based on a molecular fingerprint across an image, but the two combined are really powerful. You can cross correlate Raman spectrum with optical spectrum, and you can do optical hyperspectral mapping of the same material and get the best of both worlds there. So we do have the ability to integrate this on a fully capable and functional Raman system 
through the Hariba system. And, and thank you for, for asking that question. We are going to, we have recorded this session and uh, we'll be providing a copy of this recorded uh, session to everybody uh, that was uh, on the system. So what's the difference in the spectrum between the virus and the virus interacting with the red blood cell? So when the virus is in plasma, it, it's in a different environment than when the virus is interacting with or in the red blood cell. The red blood cell has really complex optical spectrum, principally based on the hemoglobin. And so the virus particle is going to have a different spectrum depending on what environment it's in, which means that if I want to build a spectral library to map virus particles anywhere in whole blood, for example, I'm going to build that optical uh, spectral library based on virus in or on the whole blood cell, in or on the red blood cell, and in the plasma as well, so that I've got a, a library that's representative of both. However, if you want to, you could build uh, the spectral library of both conditions. Let's say you were interested in understanding how many virus particles were interacting with the red blood cells. You could build a spectral library just of that and measure that independent of the virus particles that were also in the sample but were in the plasma, for example. Uh, which is the size limit in terms of resolution? Um, so if we look at size limit, let's talk about size limit not in terms of resolution, but in terms of detection, right? Resolution is the ability to see two objects and that they're a certain distance apart and to be able to resolve those two, okay? And so that's a classic, uh, you know, you know, uh, Abbey's Law or Raleigh's Criterion definition of, of resolution. We're not focused on resolution. We're focused on scatter detection. And we have the ability to detect scatter of, say, noble metals, plasmonic uh, materials down to about 10 nanometers, their scatter detection. Now, a virus particle is not going to have the same scatter efficiency or a liposome is not going to have the same scatter efficiency. So, our detection is probably going to be a little bit north of, say, 50 nanometer. Uh, with virus particles that are the size of, say, 80 or 90 nanometers, we know we can detect that scatter from, from those guys and measure those. Um, and certainly those that are north of 100 nanometers, we can detect the scatter from those as well and measure those too. It says, okay, the automation analysis of spectrum, is it possible uh, to, to sort a surface mapping? Um, yes, it is. Uh, you can sort based on different areas of the image. You can spatially subset an image. You can spectrally subset. And so if you, as you saw in the H1N1 single wall carbon nanotube example, uh, Dr. Raju Bodyready was able to map both the, the single wall carbon nanotubes and the virus together in the image. Okay. You could actually put a mask over a single uh, cell if you wanted to and just map things that were in that mask. There's a lot of variability about how you can conduct the spectral mapping through different areas of the sample. What is the background of the lung tissue in the detection of respiratory viruses? Is it possible to combine fluorescent virus and normal virus. So yes, if you, if you had a fluorescent label on a virus and you had some virus particles that were not fluorescently labeled, um, the fluorescent label on the virus is going to change its optical spectrum. Now the emission from that virus's fluorescent label is going to change the spectrum. Um, you might be just looking at the fluorescence emission, but if you'll recall earlier in the presentation, we talked about the ability of the system to measure uh, the, the optical spectrum, whether the material in the sample is producing that as scatter, as surface plasmon resonance space scatter, as fluorescent emission, photoluminescence, bioluminescence. However, the material is interacting with the light and the scatter or the emission that comes off of that um, from the sample we can measure those differences. So yes, we can measure uh, different types of materials that may be producing, one may be producing a fluorescence emission, one may be producing scatter, simple scatter. Regarding the background, 
Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, you would need to go back and look at that paper a little bit later on, and I'm sure they would describe those conditions in, in which the, uh, the, the, the cells were grown. But, but my guess is those cells were probably grown on, on, on a, a glass cover slip uh, in a well plate maybe and placed on the microscope slide and imaged that way. But I, I don't know exactly for sure. I do know that, that it didn't appear that those uh, cells, those epithelial cells, were fluorescently labeled in any way, which, of course, they don't need to be uh, with this technique. How did you do the mapping in the example that you showed? Okay, so um, the algorithm that we use that's in our hyperspectral software uh, is an algorithm called Spectral Angle Mapper. And if you were to go out and Google Scholar Spectral Angle Mapper, you would see maybe dozens of peer review publications on this mapping algorithm. And I, I think I would be remiss if I didn't go back and, and talk about the fact that hyperspectral imaging has its origins for aerial or geospatial related imaging, where uh, you, uh, in the old days you, you put a hyperspectral camera on uh, an airplane and you flew over a wheat field and you might, and there you can capture a hyperspectral image of the wheat field where you're measuring pixels not in nanometers but in meters. And you are actually able to distinguish wheat that may have uh, a fungus versus wheat that doesn't, so you know where to apply the fungicide in the, in the wheat field. Now drones are all the rage for hyperspectral imaging in that level. Uh, and so what we did is take hyperspectral imaging out of the airplane, in effect, and put it on the microscope and use the translational stage to move the sample instead of moving the uh, camera over the field of view. And But we still, we use a product called ENVI as our base hyperspectral image analysis system, ENVI. And we picked ENVI because it's a super well-vetted baseline product for hyperspectral image analysis with hundreds of thousands of seat licenses around the world. And we spent a lot of time and effort working with research clients around the world to customize ENVI for the microscope and for nanoscale analysis. Uh, and we use ENVI, and we use the spectral angle mapper algorithm that's resident in ENVI to do the mapping. We have the ability to do mapping in other ways, however, as well, too. One of those ways that we built is just the map based on the peak of the wavelength within certain uh, peak wavelength of parameters, uh, as another example. Could you combine it with confocal microscopy? Uh, technically, I think you could. Um, it's not something that we recommend. Uh, it seems that there can be lots of conflict on the same microscope frame with confocal uh, versus this technique, and without working through those, uh, there there's, could be some trouble with it. Uh, we do know some people that have done it in the past that, that, that were really advanced microscopists and made it work successfully, but um, we recommend this as a standalone generally. And in, in lieu of putting it on an existing confocal microscope, because those two applications sort of get in the way of each other from time to time. And really, if you think about the cost of hyperspectral imaging, the microscope itself is 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 the commodity. The microscope frame and the objectives is the commodity uh, in the setup, and it's a really low cost part of of the actual system itself. So. Could you differentiate between virus particles and exosomes? Absolutely, yes. Um, we've done some exosome work uh, a little bit in, in the past, and, and uh, if we look at exosomes and we look at virus particles, we, we'd have to do the work before we said definitively, definitively that this virus particle and this exosome have distinctly different spectrum. But if you looked at, uh, you know, endosomes in the cell structure, right, for example, where you looked at the simulant H HIV uh, uh, interacting with the epithelial cells, and we were able to differentiate those. Uh, if you think about uh, exosomes, you know, uh, having s some similar features to the endosome in the cell, uh, I, I could say with pretty high confidence we should be able to di differentiate those. Okay. Um, says, how many fields of view would be necessary in order to detect virus presence in the sample? How long would that take? Wow, so um, in the case of, of the blood sample that I did, I, it was one field of view, you know. And the thing about it is, is that with this automated stage, you can zoom around the field of view 
and and see anything you, that you want. And and uh, you know we were looking at this with a trained eye, you know, with some experience and looking at virus particles in the blood cell, and it was pretty obvious there that we had it. Um, but so it was a one take uh, one take uh, deal in terms of the hyperspectral image analysis. It just took a minute or two to find the field of view uh, for the first time. Once you really know to get the optical image, it just takes seconds really to uh, to focus the uh, to focus the condensing system, focus the objectives, and, and you're there. And then within just a few seconds, you're capturing the hyperspectral image itself. So it only takes a few seconds. Could you combine the software? with conventional microscopy. Absolutely. So one of the things that we that you can do is you can have a dual port and we actually typically provide this system with a dual port so that you can have an optical camera and the hyperspectral camera both on the dual port camera mount so that you can capture video such as I showed you earlier of the uh, staph bacteria and the and the bacteriophage or still a color video, as well as hyperspectral images. So you can do standard microscopy, you can do bright field, you can do fluorescence, uh, uh, standard microscopy, reflected, be transmitted in terms of where the light's coming from, um, and then you can also do optical hyperspectral imaging as well. Good question. Can you uh, distinguish between the virus and pegylated virus? I don't know what would be the short answer. We do know that when you uh, functionalize engineered nanoparticles, so for example, if we, those gold nanoparticles that we showed you earlier with the virus, we do know that putting a sufficient molar weight of PEG on an engineered nanoparticle changes its spectrum, okay? Uh, and uh, we've seen that time and time again. So uh, I would suspect that if you were to pegylate a virus particle, that you'd probably change its optical spectrum as well. But I've, I've not seen that yet, so I would we would have to test that to, to confirm that it's possible. Uh, but I would say that it, that it's likely. Uh, question is, why don't you use internal reference? Uh, how do you normalize light and fluctuations between the sample for both reflectance uh, and transmitted uh, dark field? So. There is actually in the software, we have uh, the ability to uh, do what we refer to as lamp normalization, but where you're using lamp spectrum to really uh, adjust for the instrument response to get the quote pure spectrum of, of the sample. I will tell you though that the actual spectrum that we used uh, of the virus particles in the red blood cell was raw spectrum. We didn't normalize that didn't need to normalize that. The spectrum was so different in order to distinguish the differences. But that's something that you uh, do need to do with a lot of samples. And and certainly if you wanted to reference differences between transmitted uh, enhanced dark field and standard reflected dark field, uh, you know, you would need to do uh, normalization in order to be able to, to uh, take into account the differences that you that you might see there. And finally, uh, just one last very well done presentation. Thank you. Appreciate that. And thank you guys for attending today. We're really appreciative. If you have other questions, you can, please feel free to re reach out to us. Uh, info at siteaviva.com might be the fastest way to get us. If you want to learn more about how this might work with science that you're involved in or samples that you may have, we'd be pleased to talk to you about that. Uh, potentially even do some test imaging of your samples as appropriate, either here in our lab or, or, or on site uh, as whatever makes sense and, uh, and help you in any way we can. Thank you.